Friends, welcome to another edition of the Landscape and Garden Show with Bob and BT Bob Harvey and yours truly, Brian Turner, here on the Alive and Social Network, especially Alive today. Wouldn't you say there, dear Bob Harvey? We are so alive, enjoying this fabulous weather that has just heralded the arrival of foliage and flora and some frolicking of the fauna. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I got to use the line. The only part that's missing is us. He's a poet, but he don't know it. But his feet show it. They're long fellows. Oh, Doing. this is going to be a brief show. How could I not put that line out there? Famous from the thespian history. Uh, and joining us here, a very special show, because Lisa Moriarty is here from Paths of Peace Labyrinth Construction Company. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Hello Lisa. So happy to be here. Good, Thank you. Oh, good to have you here. What a pleasure. We... Uh, We've got some tales. Uh, Lisa has some tales to tell in regard to recent adventures, recent mm -hmm. projects that she's working on. How did you two guys meet? Bob Harvey, you start first. I'll let you tell the tale first of how you and Lisa first met. And then we'll find out you know, the truth from Lisa or, or another's <laughs> perspective, perhaps. We, you go. No, I told no, 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 I'm going, you. No, I'm okay. going first. Uh, we were looking for uh, a client of ours was interested in installing a labyrinth, and we were connected up right. through, I think, the client, wasn't it? It was, because Jeannie was on a tour with me in France to the Chart Cathedral. And uh, well, that's where we met, and that was, oh gosh, many, many years ago. And she has always wanted to have a labyrinth of her own. Now, you, you should explain to our uh, podcast listeners here, in case they don't know, what is a labyrinth? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Because most people, the first thing they think of is a maze, like right. those uh, mm -hmm. cornfield mazes that we have mm -hmm. in the fall, which are, which are really puzzles and challenges. Um, but great for the kids. Yeah, well, it's great for the kids. Kids love that. But they also love labyrinths, which is a little bit different, because a maze has choices. You have to decide which way to turn. There could be dead ends sure. and uh, tricks and things in that. But in a labyrinth, it might look confusing, but it's a single path that you just simply put one foot in front of the other, follow the path, and it will bring you to the goal. So it's really, um, it's a spiritual journey. It's meant to be a metaphor for a spiritual journey, it sounds like. It is, exactly. And so part of the idea with the labyrinth is that you can let go of the need to solve it or to solve the problem and just simply try to be present to each footstep. Oh, I love that. And that allows us to move into a place of meditation, of contemplation, of quiet, and uh, just being aware of the present moment. Yeah, being in that place step by step. Mm -hmm. I lived in Crete, Greece, as a young man in the U.S. Air Force. Mm -hmm. I was stationed there from 1978 uh, through the end of 1979, so a year and a half. And that's where the original, in history, the original labyrinth was built at the Palace of Knossos on the island of Crete. The uh, king of Knossos had Daedalus design the labyrinth. That's where the Minotaur lived. I'm bringing up sort of some key words, some key phrases that people might remember just whether they've associated them or not to what we're talking about here. But the Minotaur, this uh, bull-like mythical creature, lived in the, in the labyrinth. And, uh, and people would be put into the task of, of finding their way through the labyrinth. And few succeeded. Theseus succeeded because he slew the Minotaur. That's true. How did I do? You did quite well. All right. Yes. Nice. <laughs> Such is mythology. Yes, indeed. And there's lots of mythology around the labyrinth. And, and give us a couple more examples. I mean, what, what, other, what other mythos uh, is out there? Well, to go back to the labyrinth at the cathedral in Chartres. Okay. There's lots of stories around that because it has some uh, internal symbolism within that. And people think that, the, uh, that some of that symbolism is related to a lunar calendar to find the date for Easter. Some people think that if you put a hinge on the floor, the, the rose window from the west wall would land smack in the center of the labyrinth. And, and that's not true, but uh, those are the fun things that happen, you know, in, uh, within that sort of mythological space where people f come up with ideas and theories on what it might be or what it might mean. And, uh, and, and what, what, which one do you carry in your heart? 
the uh, the contemplative uh, spiritual journey? Uh, well, for me, the labyrinth doesn't have any container within it. You know, it's it's really open to each individual person's experience of that, and that's what I think is really important to keep to keep in mind is that there's no wrong way to experience a labyrinth. And each time you experience one, it's going to be different, even if you're walking the same labyrinth over and over again. Sure, so yeah. Being open to what might be there for you and, and what you bring to it is, is really important to the experience of the labyrinth itself. Okay, now uh, we're going to ask you about your business too as, as we get through the course of the show. But now I want you to piggyback on what Bob was saying. Is that is that how you guys met? And it was the project and all yeah, of that? And yeah. Yes, it was. And, and, and it was the, the client that brought us together yeah. because she wanted a labyrinth and she wanted a Paths of Peace labyrinth. And Bob's company was doing the landscaping there. And she just said, I want you to meet my landscaper because nice. he has some ideas. Yeah, it's a wonderful setting and where we uh, ended up Laying out the labyrinth, I think, is absolutely ideal. So it's it's a perfect example of all the pre-planning and designing on the front end before anything goes in the ground and getting people to communicate and work together because what her expertise brings to the table also infuses our expertise to work together and to create this wonderful outcome. So it's very collaborative. And that will be reflected in the finished product. So paint a picture for us then, Bob, as the landscaper. Jeannie is the client's name. Mm -hmm. So just give us a little idea. I mean, where you know where is this? What was her desire with having a labyrinth? And you can illuminate on that too, Lisa. But you know, kind of paint a picture of, of, of this garden project and this landscape project. Well, it, it, it's very relational. And that getting to know the client uh, and her ideas and visions lots of ideas, visions, and then finding out her practices, her daily rituals. What does she want to do, both from a visual perspective as well as a uh, functional, uh, in the garden, in the moment, in the landscape uh, experience. And it's absolutely the most enticing thing for us to do, adventurous for us in the uh, landscape architecture world. It's, it's being able to three-dimensionally reproduce what's going on in her mind and suiting it up with what we have expertise in and making sure we work with the other experts and the areas that broaden that whole uh, picture of, you know, not everybody's putting a labyrinth in. And I'm sure we'll spend some time today talking about what does it take, what would be the cost, what, why would you do it, the why, the where, the how, all that kind of thing. But uh, in this situation, it, is, it, it will be a total experience. So things don't exist as separate entities. They're, they're not like knickknacks on the coffee table where this has its part. And, this, and it's memory. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, we're looking at all the, the viewpoints and the view sheds, in, both inside the house, outside, what you see when you t round a corner, what will it look like in the evening, what will it look like with lighting, um, what does it look like, how does it function when there are guests or entertaining going on, what about privacy issues. All these things are taken into consideration, and then they're, they're dialogued with the client and anyone else that's responsible for implementing this design. So I'm, I'm very excited because I love collaborative design. And um, so we're having fun together, and it's going to be, I'm sure it will just be one of many that we'll be able to to participate in in a, in a uh, journey of more experiences like this one to come. Well, let me say this out loud. What I've learned about doing this show with you in the last number of weeks is that is the complete mantra of Bob Harvey and Edelweiss Design. Mm -hmm. And that is the collaborative process is what you're and this, this company and what you guys do is all about. And that's a, that's a wonderful and unique experience because clients that, you know, that want to work with you well, know, know that they're going to get into something that isn't Bob's vision imposed on the landscape or on the homescape. It's, it's meant to be something that's a, a, a lived-in, thought-through process that involves everybody. Kids, Thank you. mom and dad, uh, if there's animals in the family, I mean, they, they're going to be integrated into what the thinking process is here. Like you said, going inside the bedrooms or the living room or whatever it is and looking outside, seeing where the views are going to be, spotlighting those and making sure that those all have some meaning and bearing when it comes to what the final product is. And I'd like to also add um, that... It 
in working with Bob and his company that he's open to working with other people like myself as my work is focused solely on labyrinths. I'm not a landscape designer. I don't know my flowers, one from the other. Or, but um, You just I, know they're pretty, right? <laughs> that's right, and that's <laughs> important, work. right? Yeah. So, um, but it's, it's not often that a landscape company will come in and, and ask for someone like me to, to help them or to work with them. More often, I'll find uh, labyrinths that will be put in by landscape companies who have not a clue what a labyrinth is, but they've seen a picture in, you know, on the Internet, sure. and they try to do it without really understanding what it, what's behind it. And I think what this calls attention to is that, <clears throat> excuse me, the... The experience of the journey and the process of getting to the end product is as important, as particularly in this situation, as the final product, because there's all kinds of things that go on in the process, and that is evaluation, reevaluation, um, confirming things, um, allowing the creativity juices to continue to flow and say, you know what, we could do this here, or we could add on here. Even though we had this idea initially, right, but now yeah. we're See, discovering that the this... Thing about, the thing mm. about uh, sometimes with us in the profession is we feel sometimes that we have to be glued to what we put down on paper in two dimension. That does not tell the whole truth in a three-dimensional environment. Sure. It also doesn't necessarily reflect the amount of of input and guidance that comes from the client. We think we have the degree, therefore we have all the answers. And where those answers are best expressed is when you get the feedback and the direction that's coming from the people. It, it's amazing to think that people without any sense of degree, education in landscape architecture or horticulture or um, any of the things that are related to that can come up with some of the best ideas. And then it's our job as professionals to see how that can be incorporated and expressed in a complete way, you know, a comprehensive way. And so that, that collaborativeness and dialogue actually is a very exciting and adventurous part. Mm -hmm. And that gets reflected in the, the final product. And then you see it in the landscape, you see it and you go, this is emotive because it, it is expressive and reflective of all the things that we've worked through. Some people have more patience than others in terms of the timeline that that takes to get there. It's sometimes it can't be rushed, but it will be right. Right. Yeah, especially when plants are involved in living organic material. Right. Things are and moving all and that. changing. It's yeah. not like rearranging the furniture yeah. in the living room. It's not a static environment. It's a moving, changing environment. And what it looks like today or two weeks from now or two years or 20 years from now all is taken into consideration so that we we our job is to be able to anticipate 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 mm -hmm. before we delegate and implement it's almost uh, akin to perhaps that overview uh lisa showed us a shot showed us a picture of the labyrinth at the cathedral at chartres in france and it's almost as though you're you're looking at that overhead view of the labyrinth you can see the beginning the starting point and all of those twists and turns, it's one path, as Lisa said. There are no surprise turns or twists or choices or dead ends. It's, a, it's as though I'm, I'm, I'm finding a metaphor here that the landscape journey with a client is almost like having, or creating, let me say, creating that big overview labyrinth picture that you're going to have twists, you're going to have turns, you're going to be on a journey together, you're going to do it step by step. It's going to take a, a certain amount of time to make your way through it. You can go as slow or as quickly as you need to from time to time. Sometimes there are long stretches. You know you're not going to have a twist or a turn for we can see it. And you're going to be able to go a little faster. Sometimes you've got to turn that corner. It's a little slower. Did my metaphor work? Oh, it's mm. fabulous. Is it working? <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I really, <laughs> I mean, it just occurred to me, you know, all we're talking about with, with what you do mm -hmm. and the things you create and those that you have been influenced by is exactly the, the path that we're talking about here in regard to working with people, working with clients, and, and making things like that happen. Sure, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just wonderful. When I heard Bob's description, I was thinking exactly the same thing, step by step along the journey, and that the journey itself is as important as reaching the goal. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, 
Bob, I think before we get into a little more chat with Lisa about labyrinths and designs and the name of her company and her inspirations. Uh, what's blooming? What's blooming? What's in bloom, Bob Harvey? Oh, we should Absolutely. really say at this time of the year, what's, what's not? Booming. No, booming. Yeah. booming. We, we change, we have, a, we have a subtitle to our company uh, name so at a, this time of the year. Edelweiss Design. Uh, alias... Kaboom, Kaboom. Landsca <laughs> landscaping. I'll show you some of the images of what we've been doing in the last week, but transforming these these places as we add in the new plantings this year, both on a perennial. I mean, we're talking about the properties that we maintain. We do total prop property management. management so sure. after the kind of logistical stuff is done, the startup of the irrigation systems, the tweaking of that, the the maintenance on lighting systems, uh, lawn repair, all that kind of stuff. Then you get to do the really fun stuff. The color starts to show. What we've already put in the ground last fall, again, anticipating its display this spring. Sure. And when, uh, when we put our bulbs in last fall, all 15 to 20,000 of them, <laughs> we anticipated early, mid, and late blooming bulbs, tulips mainly. Uh, even daffodils have some uh, spread on their blooming time and narcissus but it extends that whole bloom season so that as the other things that are staples in the landscape like your blooming shrubs your blooming ornamental trees and fruit trees as well as uh, early emerging perennials they get to overlap uh, several different ways with sure. the bulbs sure so i just think of one example in a garden that we've done where the early spring color tulips were the bright bright yellow the screaming red and some white and a few striped uh, uh these are the early uh, blooming darwin tulips they call them and as they fade the next level of tulips that are coming in right now total different color palette so they're the 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 uh, creamy whites and some pinks and purples and some deep rosy reds and and they happen to overlap over a lap with the lilacs that are blooming oh, right sure. now. So then, you, you know, but we thought about that last fall and even before that when we were mapping out the designs. So when, you know, it sounds like a broken record. We say, well, this week we have tulips blooming. Well, guess what? There are many years where we have blo two blooming tulips for six weeks. That's wonderful. And people think about it for maybe one or two weeks and they'll plant the same variety. But if you get down to the science and art of it, you can, you can mm -hmm. really extend the season particularly if the weather cooperates. So that's the bulb category. Then um, the lilacs, of course, are in bloom. And I want to talk a little bit about li li lilacs okay. because they're so prevalent everywhere. And we think of the common purple that lines the highways, um, yep, we a lot of lilac about, lanes. Uh, talking about Highway 100 recently on the show. But if you are enticed to go out and purchase some lilac shrubs right now because every you know your neighbors have them but you don't or they have a color you don't or you're wondering about some of the new varieties great time to get them because you can shop them while they're blooming in the nurseries and sure. see exactly what you're getting makes complete sense so i'm just going to mention a few favorites of mine uh under the deep magenta purple you know that really deep violet color there's one called charles jolly j-o-l-y and it is a wonderful deep uh fragrant purple lilac that um, a friend of mine's uh, mother passed away this past week and so I took over this beautiful vase of flowers from the garden and had that deep Charles Jolet and then I had the double white creamy white lilac it's called Beauty of Moscow and that's a fantastic one it's very elegant and it, it lasts quite a while if you uh, beat the stems a little bit on okay. lilac stems when you put them in the water and then uh, some that are going to be coming a little bit later are like the. Uh, I want you. I want yes. you. To, I want you to step back for just a yep. second. I want you to step back for just a second. A, a little technique there that I'm not aware of, and I want you to share that right now. Well, if you beat the stems a little bit, I don't know what you were talking about there. Well, the lilac stems. Are you saying that they'll last longer in the vase or what have you? Yes, because they, they, the 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 woody stemness is is not uh, when you make uh, just a cut. It doesn't uh, have the capacity to take up enough water right? to support the flower so they'll start to wilt pretty quick but if you just kind of 
beat the stems a little bit with a, a little hammer, or, you know, a little rock or something, just to kind of shred it a little bit. Then so there's the more very, surface area that gotcha, can take up the water. Gotcha. So at the very end of the where the cut is, yeah, in about one or two inches, you just kind of beat yeah, it up a little, and yep. bang it up. So you've yep. got yep. So some some shredding, so to speak. Okay, exactly. And it lets more water intake. Did, yes, did, did, I didn't know that. Yep. So there there's you go. Something I new. love that. <laughs> yep. Beat up, but I love the way you describe. You got to beat up the ends. You got to beat up the ends. Beat them up a little bit. That's why. Okay. Thank you for letting me. And then the, our That's next session, technique. we'll I'm talk about it. what do you do with lilacs after they bloom, because this one's a forgotten chore. Okay. Um, so those are ones that are blooming right now. And then some that are going to come a little bit later. Just on the heels are the Miss Kim lilacs and the uh, dwarf Korean lilacs. They're the smaller, more petite kind of lilacs. And those just come a little bit later, a little different fragrance. And um, they're opening this week as we speak. And um, then there's a couple uh, other re-blooming varieties that are quite delicate when they are first go in, but they, they make a showing over time called Boomerang, the Boomerang series. Okay. So that's, that's the whole lilac category. Then we have the Viburnum family, which are the Viburnums now are all opening. Now, this is an understated or uh, not as well-known kind of shrub to incorporate into the landscape, but it's, it's very common in woodland settings. And the, the, there's many different varieties. But one that comes to mind that's very ornamental, people see it blooming. It's opening up this week. And they see it blooming. They, have the, they see these greenish-white balls. or like extra-large golf balls or kind of hydrangea-shaped flowers. And they're going, wow, what kind of hydrangea do they have that's blooming in May? I want to get one of those. Well, it's not a hydrangea. Okay, it's the viburnum. It is the snowball viburnum. The snowball viburnum, viburnum roseum. And it is a very, very delightful thing to have right now, particularly up against those lilacs. Very nice color contrast and texture combination. And then we're in, still in the prunus family uh, when, we, when it comes to color. Right now we have the double flowering plum, one of my favorites that opens up. It looks like a light pink double flowering, uh, about inch, inch and a half wide flowers, completely covers the, the, the shrub. Or it comes on a standard like a little tree. And we have that in a couple settings in our clients' gardens. And right now, it is the showpiece in the garden. It looks beautiful. like something out of Giverney. You know, it's just absolutely beautiful. It's delicate. It's wonderful. It's this true pink color. And it overlaps with the crab apples. We still have crab apples going now and some of the later blooming ones. One of my favorite on crab apples is the, uh, um, oh, escaped me. It'll come back. Okay. And then uh, azaleas. Let's talk about azaleas. Azaleas. Is that big family of both azaleas and rhododendrons fall underneath now? They've kind of com combined those categories. So the purpley ones, the PGMs, have kind of faded by now. But the azaleas are opening those twiggy shrubs with no evergreen leaves. My favorites uh, are the uh, rosy lights, which is a hot pink, and the northern highlights, which will be opening here by the end of the week. It's a nice creamy yellow. And there's other varieties knowing that these azaleas were developed right here for hardiness at the Minnesota Arboretum. Very cool. And I had the pleasure when I first started my business 30 years ago here of actually meeting the breeder that developed those. At the, uh, at the Arboretum. And actually yeah. was able to do a couple projects where I got some of the original azaleas from the test garden. In, into some of my uh, landscapes. So that was really fun. Then there is a rhododendron that is blooming now that's not purple, it's pink, and it's called Algo, A-L-G-O. And that's a really uh, showy shrub right now. So that covers it on the shrub and tree category. Our horse chestnuts are opening. I, I mentioned last week that they were getting ready to push, and they are, so they're, they're showing up. And the Jap tree lilac. Now these are the tree form lilacs that are you know, anywhere from 12 to 20 feet tall that can uh, produce these big panicles of white lilacs. They're very, very fragrant. In fact, they could be overpowering in, in small settings. I used to have one in my backyard. Yes. Yep. And so they're, they're, their buds are all out. The buds are all formed on the ends of the, of the trees, and uh, they're getting ready to open here in the next week. So they're, they're uh, again, one of those plants that with the white display. We, mm. we love having white in the landscape because then it, it, it just enhances all the other color combinations. It does. That, I miss that tree to this day. You know, every tree has a life cycle, yeah. you know, and that one just yeah. had And, you know, in. they grow fast enough that you, you could go ahead and start start another one. Mm. I would, I would uh, 
Now, the things that we're seeing in the garden, I photographed a lot of the gardens. This is photography time in these beautiful, beautiful settings. Bleeding hearts, perennials, wonderful display. They, they grow overnight, literally. And uh, snowdrop anemones were the little white flowers. They're very um, common in woodland settings and do very, very well there. Uh, bluebells, Mertensia, the little Virginia bluebells are all in bloom right now underneath the red bud trees, which are still blooming. So that's going on two weeks or more with the red buds. Another plant, not as common, but a bright yellow flower called leopard's bane or Deronicum. I like this in, uh, in uh, perennial edge of wood settings. It's a, kind of like a bright yellow daisy with a yellow center. Very, very nice. Um, See. Oh, our creeping phloxes are all in bloom hanging over the walls, the bright pink, the bright purple, the whites, and all the shades in between. Yep. I've seen those on a lot of landscapes coming in. Yep. And um, alliums, the spring alliums are starting to bloom. Um, coral bells, all those nice dark burgundy leaves are all unfolding. The astilbe is not blooming yet, but did you notice that beautiful deep burgundy texture and color on the on the foliage? Great backdrop. I mentioned this last week yep. against our other blooming things. So there's others. My mind is is overwhelmed with all the beautiful things that are blooming right now. Because so <laughs> you know why? I, I think I'll stop. It's kaboom season. It's kaboom That's season. That's why it's easy to Welcome get overwhelmed. Welcome to kaboom landscape and garden. Here we go. Yep. You should get that. You should get that. Uh... That URL squared away so that it always redirects to uh, yep. edelweissdesign.com. Right. I think you ought to. Let's return to Lisa Moriarty from Paths of Peace. Lisa, a recent adventure happened, uh, you mentioned, with your association with Bob and client Jeannie and how you went on a trip to the Chart Cathedral, one of the world-famous medieval labyrinths, yes. designed there, what, uh, 800 or so years ago? Just over 800 years, yes. Um, so you visited that before, but you've had a recent journey that uh, you, you just got back from, more or less? I mean, it wasn't too long ago, was it? No, it was just this weekend I wow. returned. Yeah. This was the third time I've led a small group of women on a walking pilgrimage. We walk from Paris out to the Chartres Cathedral in France. It takes three days to walk, and we carry our backpacks and uh, everything with us as we go, stay in little hotels along the way. And, and the ultimate goal is to get to that cathedral and to walk that famous labyrinth that's there. From Paris to Chartres, are there a series of pathways then, or are you on roads sometimes, or a combination of both? You know, all over France, there are walking trails, and walking is just one of the very popular activities that they do there. And so you can get maps um, of the entire country that are just crisscrossed with, with uh, walking trails. Mm. And so when we first started doing this, much of our walking was along roads because that's what we knew and that's what we could, you know, drive against and kind of figure out our path. But as we started seeing more little entries into the, uh, into the woods and across fields, we started exploring a little bit more. And now our journey is um, almost entirely off-road and uh, through woods and along rivers and through fields. Oh, that's just, I, I'm getting, I kind of closed my eyes a little bit while you were explaining it, just <laughs> because I'm getting an image and a picture that sort of uh, reflects on places I've been, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that France does that. Thank you for shutting the window, Bob. We, uh, we like to, you know, we put it out there in a real sense here on the Landscape right. and Garden Show and all the shows on the Alive and Social Network. We got the little studio space in South Minneapolis. We like to keep the window open. And uh, they're doing a little work. They're doing a little work out on the landscape yeah. of South Minneapolis there. Right. Yeah, we're going to have more. the driver of that excavator on next week's show. <laughs> <laughs> it was getting a little noisy there. So thank you, Bob. Good work. Good work. Um, uh, I, I have friends that have done similar journeys in Spain, and uh, my family's done a number of trips to Austria, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just nice to know. And, and that ethic is really, it's, it's growing, I think, in the yes. United States, but it's, of course, has a lot more history attached to it in, in the countries of Europe, so the, the pathways are a little more established and what have you. A little you. more established, and part of what we will do, uh, the cathedral in Chart is a pilgrimage cathedral. That means that for hundreds of years, people have done a pilgrimage to that cathedral. Cathedral, not necessarily for the labyrinth, but for the relic that they have there, and um, the part of the paths that uh, we pa that we walk on are also 
um, part of the original pathways that go connect to the Camino in Spain. So people who are going mm-hmm. across yes. that, uh, you know, have across to Santiago, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but leaving from Paris, okay. um, will leave from and follow the pathways that we were taking. And when I mentioned friends that had done journeys like that mm-hmm. in Spain, that's exactly what I was, sure. what I was thinking sure. of. Sure. Now, I have a question Camino. for you. You said you led a group of women on this tour, and you've done this before. Yes. After, for those listeners out here on the podcast, what do they say? I wonder if that's something that I could do, and how would I go about that? Is that something that you coordinate or have interest if there are people out there who want to talk to you more about that? Absolutely. It's a different group every year. We open registration. We only take six women plus the two co-leaders, myself and my friend. And uh, so it's open registration as people uh, are interested in doing it. Right now, we're only taking women. Well, yeah, I was going to so. say, Bob's giving me a look. <laughs> yeah. As though to say, like in Some Like It Hot with Jack Lemon and Tony Curtis, we're going to put some wigs on. <laughs> and yeah, right. I saw the both of us. <laughs> right, right. We could be attaches. <laughs> we'll get Billy Wilder's great great grandson to direct this movie, Bob. I can see it happening. <laughs> yes. the, 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 the glee in your eyes was already there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, we've had lots of interest from men, so we're thinking some some year we might do a co-ed journey or lead a men's journey or something as well but uh right now it's women it's about women's spirituality and and uh and part of it is you know it's the challenge for women we tend to have women that are 60 70 going on into their 80s mm-hmm. that come along with us and so it's one of those things where they think i'm going to do it just to prove that I can do that it. That I to can myself. do it. Yes. Yeah. And three days, even at you know an older age, mm-hmm. uh, if you're in relatively good shape, you know that's uh, that's something that can be done. Staying Absolutely. active is yeah. good, but we always say this is not a journey of deprivation. Yeah. We are walking across <laughs> France, you know. So good wine, good <laughs> cheese, cuisine, wine, yeah. you yeah. name yeah. it. Croissant. We need another yeah. bread stop. That's I can right. Feel another, another baguette. Another whip. <laughs> <laughs> Another wine stop coming That's on. That's right. That's well, there's right. a very unique added layer to this trip to the labyrinth at the cathedral at Chart. Uh, and, and I'll ask you about the, the project that you put together in just a sec. Mm-hmm. First off, when were you first influenced by this labyrinth? Because mm-hmm. this is what you do with your company. You create it labyrinths. Is. And mm-hmm. so we talked about the ruins at Kenosis and, and the history there. But there are other labyrinths constructed around the world, not all of them there anymore because of uh, being torn down, being torn up. But this one, uh, I remember it from my humanity studies when I, was a, when I was a student. And so this one must have had some, some bearing upon you, not just from the spiritual aspect of the journey and the, and, the, uh, and the pilgrimage, but from the perspective of what it is, that labyrinth at the cathedral, inside the cathedral. Right. It's over 800 years old, and it's probably the most famous um, labyrinth. Um, there are thousands of labyrinths around the world in uh, lots of different settings. But this one, because it's been uh, maintained for as long as it has been, and because it's associated with the Pilgrimage Cathedral, um, it's pop- been popularized, especially recently, within the last 20 years or so, um, that particular labyrinth and that particular labyrinth design has is probably become the most um, recognized one. What is it about the last 20 years that makes it so much more so? Well, in, uh, it sort of began in the 1980s with Jean Houston, a social anthropologist, who used the labyrinth image in her mystery school workshops. And um, the, it, we actually have probably the oldest portable labyrinth that exists here in the Twin Cities. Um, it was a fabric labyrinth that was created um, by people who worked in the social services area in Ramsey County. Mm -hmm. which was then called the Welfare Department. But they had attended some of Jean Houston's uh, mystery school and was were recreated the labyrinth on fabric so that they could use it uh, continuously when they were doing um, uh, cultural awareness and uh, some staff trainings and things like that. And so we're pretty proud to be able to say that we go way back to like 1990 in our use of the labyrinths here in the Twin Cities. But uh, one other person who attended um, Jean Houston's training is Lauren Artris, who uh, was a canon at the Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. And she became so interested in that idea of using the labyrinth uh, as a spiritual tool. 
that she started working on that, um, took a group over to Chart Cathedral and, and measured the labyrinth there, and then had replicas recreated um, at the cathedral, both an outdoor one and an interior um, labyrinth in carpet, and then also painting labyrinths on canvas, mm -hmm. which she could then take around the country to teach mm -hmm. people about how to use the labyrinth, how to facilitate Very labyrinth portable. events. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So inspired the, by this exactly. this one right here. Yep. And so the whole idea of portable labyrinth is sort of an American, you know, idea. It's not something that was is typically common around the world, except now that people are starting to use labyrinths more and more often. Um, this whole trend of using labyrinths both inside and outside has really expanded globally. That uh, portability really allows for the uh, expansion of, of awareness and uh, it, education. It does. It does. And um, using them indoors... When we work, when we live in a in an area like we do here in Minnesota, where you can't use an outdoor labyrinth many months out of the sure. year, mm -hmm. it's nice to be able to have an inside one. So, when the labyrinths first came to our area, um, in in you know more broader than just in the Ramsey County um, group, the they often came in through our churches. Mm -hmm. because of Lauren's work and uh, using the labyrinth as a spiritual tool, it tended to be more toward churches and using it for prayer and and um, that sort of meditation. Mm -hmm. so yeah, we that, found, that, that being present, uh -huh. meditative, yeah. contemplative journey that being on a labyrinth is all about. Right, mm -hmm. right. So we found um, initially most of the labyrinths that were here were in that portable form until people were really comfortable with the whole idea behind it and then would invest more into a more permanent sort of um, installation. So we have labyrinths both indoors, outdoors, and portable. And we actually are labyrinth rich here in the Twin Cities. We have more public labyrinths than any other metropolitan area in the world. Really? Yeah. Wow, yep. that's yep. a unique fact. Puts us on the map. It wow, is. It you're really in the right is. place, too. Yeah. <laughs> and how many of those have you been involved in? I imagine here quite a few. Here yeah. in the Twin Cities? Yeah. Well, yeah, I've a number of them. Yeah, <laughs> sure. It's something to be proud of. Absolutely. <laughs> you, yes. So the portable labyrinth that you were mentioning and, and Gene Houston and all of that, mm -hmm. uh, you created one for this latest trip, this latest journey. Now, you felt it was a little more something out of necessity, right? Well, yes, because at the cathedral in France, they're undergoing a huge program of renovation, interior renovation, where they are trying to keep bring the interior stone pillars and walls and, and cleaning up the windows back to their original form, Um from 800 years of, mm. of uh, candle soot and whatnot mm -hmm, that sure. has discolored the walls. And so it's been a process where they, they, they do a section of the cathedral at a time. And beginning next week, that um, the scaffolding is going to be moving over where the pavement labyrinth is on the inside of that cathedral. So the interior labyrinth will not be available for people to walk. And... As we were planning our pilgrimage this year, we intentionally set it for the springtime um, because we believed that that interior labyrinth was going to close down in June. Well, they ran ahead of schedule. And so when it came to about two months outside of where when we were ready to leave, the news was that the labyrinth was going to be closed at, after Easter, which means whoops, we, it's not going to be open to us. Right. So plan B for us was to um, bring along a portable labyrinth wow. that we could lay out in the cathedral and walk. Wherever there would be Wherever open space. Wherever there was mm -hmm. space, yep. Because part of what we do in our, in our time, our, my co-leader has an apartment in Chartres, and she's an English-speaking uh, tour guide in the cathedral. She's from Minneapolis here, hmm. but she does this part-time. And so she has great relationship with the folks at the cathedral. And we do a little private evening after hours where we have the cathedral to ourselves. And so we would have the opportunity to move some chairs and lay out a portable labyrinth if, if that other one wasn't available to us. So 
So for this one, I created a labyrinth on some durable outdoor fabric material and painted it to resemble the original stone labyrinth there in right down to the cracks in the stones, mm -hmm. um, but had to do it in a size and um, a weight that I could put in a rolling suitcase mm -hmm. and, and so, put on. The <laughs> and so how big is it? Gosh. It's 30 feet, 30 feet wow. by 30 feet okay. and uh, weighs about 50 pounds when it's all folded sure. up and, and it can be folded away, but it's one piece, so it can be laid out rather quickly and uh, made on a beige sort of cloth that uh, matches the limestone of the cathedral floor. Of the actual mm -hmm. labyrinth stone itself. Yeah. yeah. And you used uh, awning material, so yeah. it's outdoor, heavy-duty fabric, so people can walk on durable. it. It can be cleaned mm -hmm. and very durable. Mm -hmm. So what a unique thing. As it turns out, you were able to walk the actual yes, labyrinth. But yes, it was a gift to be able to walk the original labyrinth. But in, because we had that uh, portable along, we laid it out as well, um, just next to the original labyrinth and uh, had both of them there. And then I'm leaving the portable one there behind. Oh, sweet. So that it can be used uh, in the mm -hmm. cathedral during the times when the labyrinth is actually not going to be available, which will be about a year and a half. Sure. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's a long time. So I can imagine literally thousands and thousands of pairs of feet are going to walk on this awning material labyrinth that you constructed and left behind as a as a, as a gift that's, you know for the time being i mean that's really what's that's happening the here intention, isn't it intention right isn't we don't know cool? how often it's going to be used sure. by whom i don't expect that the cathedral is going to lay it out every friday like they you know opened the other cathedral labyrinth um, just because it's, I don't think they know what to do with portable labyrinths so much. But sure. there's a group there that's associated with the, the cathedral. And so they're going to be um, using it and in, including taking it all the way to Saint-Michel, where they're leading mm. a retreat. And so one of the benefits of this portable labyrinth is just that, that, that is it's portable. You go. Absolutely. And so it's not only going to be used at the cathedral, but could be used um, around the country. That's just a lovely story. Yeah. That's just great. And, and uh, it gives you a really good excuse, not that you needed one, but a year and a half from now, oh, I got to head back. Got to go get my labyrinth. my portable labyrinth <laughs> back again. Oh, darn. And, uh, and, and by the way, uh, who are those two women over there with the funny looking wigs? Yeah. Who are you? Yeah, I can yeah. see this. Yeah, I can, this is, I'm setting yeah. it up here. I'm setting it up here, Harvey. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Their voices are a little deeper than the rest uh, yeah. of us. Yeah. Well, by that and their time, French is really awful. Yeah. <laughs> by that time, I might have to have a co-ed group so I can get some go. strong men to carry their we'll carry them back. <laughs> there you, we have a job. There we have go. a mission. Indeed. <laughs> a All purpose. Done. <laughs> Absolutely, we're your uh, we're your guys. Given given the sound of the uh, of the the uh, the ladies that you've been mentioning here that have been on the journey, I don't think you're going to need any help toting stuff. Well, no. you know, it sounds no. like you've got it all going on that they way. Were fully capable of bringing Absolutely. it out there, so yeah. I'm sure we could get it back. <laughs> Absolutely, that's just a wonderful story. That's Cute. just great, uh, Bob. Cool. We got to move on to uh, uh, a few things here. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll return to Lisa here. Okay. Uh, we're going to pick up on uh, where we left off with the roses last week. But, but first, uh, this week, because we talked about some repellents last week on the mm -hmm. Landscape and Garden Show. And as it turns out, over the course of the last week, you've had quite a few people come up to you and just ask, because it's the season, uh, what kind, I've got the deer. They are driving me nuts. Uh, they're eating my plants. Uh, repellents notwithstanding, they've been asking you about deer-resistant plants that can be put in the landscape. So... What have you been telling folks? Well, we obviously incorporate this <clears throat> formula of plants, uh, combinations in so many settings that are just uh, totally unprotected. You know, a lot of the more na natural woodland settings where there is a deer population, and it's not necessarily out in the suburbs. We have deer issues right in town. Absolutely. I have an area over on Edgecombe Road in St. Paul where the deer just, I mean, you'd think they're going to ring the doorbell. I mean, they come <laughs> right up to the front door and they look at the Ponderosa salad bar on both sides of the sidewalk and help themselves. And so we've been dealing with, based on personal, the, the client's taste, the, the palette of colors and textures, all of the favorites, what can we come up with that uh, can satisfy all the requirements and minimize the damage. When there are certain situations where there just isn't enough food available and there's a large wildlife population, you're going to get damaged on just about everything. I have seen rabbits completely decimate 
Colorado blue spruce, bird's nest spruce that are so prickly. I mean, you can feel the prickles just looking at it. (laughs) And at the end of the winter, they'll be completely skeletonized. Um, so that, you know, they will lower their standards to, to get to some of these if things. If they're hungry, absolutely. General rule of thumb, when you're thinking about planting deer or rabbit resistant, and we're talking mostly about foliage and branches and twigs and things like that. There's a whole nother category when we're dealing with things that are subterrain, like root systems of plants and trunks of plants at the base of the plant material. Trees, shrubs, roses, those kinds of things. Like the Wajila that I have that was completely rabbit eaten last year. Yeah, last yummy winter. bark. Mm-hmm. Yum, 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 yum. Yeah. So uh, with with that in mind, we we start with the the upper what's above ground. And uh, things that tend to be the most resistant in, say, for instance, tree. There's a lot of trees that basically survive just fine. You don't see a lot of damage on the tree itself, like a maple or a crab apple or the things like that, unless the, the foliage is really tender and sweet. So not a big issue there. We get into shrubs or evergreens, for instance. Uh, junipers tend to be the last resort. A lot of the evergreens in the juniper family, the cedar family, tend to be the, um, not the cedar so much, the, the juniper family. Cedars, we're talking arbor vitae, mm-hmm. uh, are tasty and sweet, and they will succumb to quite a bit of grazing in the wintertime. You drive down a highway or you see someone who's planted a beautiful arbor vitae hedge and up you know, six feet from the ground, seven feet from the ground. It's like somebody put a constriction on them and they're all like, <laughs> you know, and then the top's all safe and fluffed Flowery, out. And you're like, wow, green, what's green, going on? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, you know how tall the deer are in your neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> so that the arborvitaes are really uh, off lim- uh, limits as far as, unless you're willing to do all the protection measures, which we've just discussed. Scotch pines, Austrian pines are uh, some of the last to be grazed. Even white pine tend to be the last thing on the evergreen list to be grazed. In the uh, shrub category, so the shrub category, think about things with lots of thorns and prickles. Most of the time, you're pretty safe if we talk about barberries for deer. But in the wintertime, you will get grazing underneath from things like voles and moles that will just basically girdle things like barberries and wajilias and things like that. Boxwoods, definitely by far at the very top of the list of the last thing that any of the wildlife will touch. Okay. What you have to deal with with boxwood is site, location, and protection. Uh, Many instances, we have uh, boxwoods that look fabulous every year, no matter what the weather, because of their location. Other instances... Get a big brown spot somewhere, came out of the winter damage. Dogs or male dogs are very attracted to boxwood, just FYI. So if you have pets that you leave out in your front yard, do not plant a boxwood hedge unless you like the color yellow. Um, Bush catoni asters or bush honeysuckle, really a very, very uh, resistant. Catoni aster hedge, again, deer and rabbits won't bother that. You will get some girdling from the underground kind of creatures, voles and moles on that. For Scythia, pretty reliable, no damage nice. in any situation. So and incorporating, a great spring and we, flowerer. Yeah, so. and we have so many more varieties, cultivars of for Scythia that we can choose from now. So that's a real good one. Hollies, the uh, native Minnesota holly is a really good one. Um, no damage to that. I mentioned different types of honeysuckle, lilacs, excellent potentilla, rhododendrons, smoke bush. Spirea family, sumac, and witch hazel. So these are all shrubs that are that are good. I talked about I, when I said trees. So things like elms, Kentucky coffee tree, hawthorn, honey locust, magnolias. No problems with any uh, wildlife on those. Maples, and robinia family, which would be the black locust family, the uh, native locust. Perennials. Now this is where most people get concerned because they're they're looking for color uh, so all season long. So in the uh, perennial category, we have things like the yarrow family, you know, the silvery foliage and the bright yellow flowers. And the reason that the yarrow is such a uh, resistant uh, plant for these wildlife is that it has two things going for it. One is texture, 
and the other is the taste. The texture comes in the fuzzy coating on the leaves, uh -huh. not desirable. And then the second one in the taste, it's an aromatic thing. So it's very strong. If you take a stem and break it and you smell it, you know it's yeah. very, very strong. Done kind of that. like bee balm, yep. Monarda, which is another real good choice. So these are the kind of plants, if it's aromatic and it's got lots going on with the foliage in terms of texture Don't like it. and furry, fuzzy, mm -hmm. you're really, you're really uh, going in the right direction. Monk's hood, which is like a, a delphinium lookalike, blooms late season, August, September, gets five, six, seven feet tall. Very poisonous. Okay. Go ahead. Let them have it. They'll, have they'll learn their lesson. We have time for two more. Two more. The Stilby family, clematises, ferns, lavender, bee balm, salvia, See what happened there, Lisa? What did I say? He does not account. <laughs> I don't know how to count. But you know what? You can't, you can't, let, you can't do your garden for deer resistance on three plants. I mean, you could, but that's just not creative enough. I love this guy. <laughs> so... We have we have we have a lot of options. The allium family, the onion family, garlic chives, uh, those kinds of things. And the aromatic, aromatic. Nope, don't like it. Mm -hmm. Don't like it. Going to keep away from it. Right. Good choices. And some of those you can integrate obviously uh, into your kitchen garden plan as well. So especially when it comes to the, to herb the onions and the chives. Be, mm -hmm. Yeah. Herb gardens tend to be left alone. All right. Before, because I want to, I want to get a little more from Lisa about uh, about labyrinth. Uh, about her labyrinth construction business. We just have uh, about eight minutes left on the show today. Um, just a couple of quick roses. Uh, we, you know, we left off last week. Uh, d just a, a few more ideas from the Rose family as we, uh, as we you know, chatted about quite a few of them last week, uh, and we, we left a little bit dangling there. So I'm just going to talk about some of the favorites that I find to be just ironclad, can rely on them. and deer resistant here too. Uh, some uh, of them are not all of them. No, no okay. you're gonna. That, that's the thing. They don't even know the thorns are there when okay. they eat them all because right. the, the, the they, they taste yeah. good. Okay. But you can get some resistance uh, when you deal with the rugosa. Uh, that's what I call the salt spray roses back in New England. They cover the banks, the oh, sandy sure. banks yep. next to the ocean, and they bloom all summer. And they get those lovely rose hips for rose hip tea on them. Again, a lot of aromatic stuff going on there and texture with the. I mean, we're talking bristly, bristly thorns. So they tend to stay away from those. When you get into roses you want to cut and that kind of thing, you're, you're running a risk. Okay. You're going to have to fence them off or protect right. them. A couple of quick faves. Favorites. Uh, one that just blooms all summer for good uh, mid-size ground cover, good color if you like red roses, Champlain. Some people say Champlain. It's Champlain. I'm from Vermont, and we live by, live Lake, by Lake, Lake Champlain. Champlain. Sure. So that's a really fun one. And then there's a new one that's come, become popular in the last couple of years. We go more towards the white elegant rose called Champagne <laughs> Wishes. So let's get the tongue twisters out of the way. Some people say champagne. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, I'll have a glass no, of they don't. Champagne or Chablis. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then the whole knockout series. That has been a very, very popular one because it's just uh, ever blooming because roses are div uh, divided into blooming categories of occasional to recur like recurrent to ever blooming. Ever blooming. Mm -hmm. So um, the double ones I tend to like better than the single ones on that. And then uh, I like yellow roses. Yellow roses that are hardy are kind of tough to come by. It's getting easier and easier. And there's one called High Voltage. Mm. High Voltage is a really nice one that has a beautiful, clear, buttery yellow that's uh, hardy. And then a little short one with a lot of yellow, and it's called Music Box. Music Box is part of the Easy Elegant series that we were that was developed right here in Minnesota at Bailey's Nursery. And they afford you a lot of options when it comes to selecting roses. Nice. I tend to be a, a real proponent of red roses in the garden. And so I'm looking at all the red options. There's one called Superhero that's very good. And um, Flower Carpet Scarlet, a very underutilized, it's a hot red uh, single kind of rambling rose. So over a wall, or I let it climb up some of my shrubs and okay. it kind of pokes its head out. Sure. Very, very fun. Yeah, the Baileys, Cat, the Baileys folks have done such a great job. And Cashmere this. is part of the... Um, the uh, English Garden series, and it's it's a beautiful rose. It's a deep burgundy red. It blooms four to five feet tall, and has a very very nice, uh, pretty much um, current recurrent to uh, ever blooming. And then there's one named after Como Park, it was developed here at Bailey's, and that that's a nice uh, 
red. And then we have a climbing rambler red rose, which is really nice. And there's some other varieties coming out there on the pink category, like John Cabot and uh, John Davis roses. Those are uh, climbers that uh, are of a lighter, softer color. So a lot of different directions we can go in here, whether it's a standout in the garden or something, like you said, integrated into the shrubs or the hedge or climbing and, and going over the wall, a lot of different mm -hmm. options. One last one I'll mention, I promise it'll be the last one. <laughs> okay. Um, sunrise, sunset, sunrise, sunset. That's the name of the rose. Nice, what color is it? It is a beautiful, it's the colors of the sunrise or there the sunset. In the ask, center though. of the rose, it's kind of a peachy, yellowy color, mm. and then it deepens to a very nice corally pink deep pink at the edges. Oh, it sounds lovely. Blooms all summer. Yeah. You can grow up or out, whichever way you want to. Put it, put an obelisk around it or over it, and you'll have it climbing up through the obelisk. Yeah, it sounds great. Mm. Sunrise, sunset. I knew we You changed the key on I, me. I did a little bit, yeah. <laughs> it's because he's a bass, and I'm, I'm a tenor. <laughs> sunrise, sunset. sunset. There we go. <laughs> Paths of peace. Where can people see some of these labyrinths that you've worked on? What's your website? Where do we where do we go to take a peek? My website is pathsofpeace.com. There you go. Pretty easy to remember. Yeah, pretty straightforward. And you know, there's a website that's called labyrinthlocator.com, which is a global um, searchable data database of labyrinths around the oh, world. Oh, that's fantastic. So you can put in a zip code and a radius of 10, 20 miles and find labyrinths all around. Um, so if you did, were you if you were to put the zip code for downtown St. Paul, for instance, in there, you would find over a hundred labyrinths well, within what, a within wow. a ten mile mm, radius. Given what you said earlier, yeah, yeah, that's just fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's a good way to find the labyrinths that we have here, and I think it's it's helpful for folks to know that the labyrinths that you can put in your yard can be as simple as a mowed design that you simply mow into the grass or into your field. Or it can be, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in hardscape to sure. create a labyrinth. Mm -hmm. So there's the whole gamut of uh, creating a labyrinth. And and uh, working with an, an expert or somebody who knows what, you know, what creates a good, viable labyrinth design is always helpful in doing that. But it doesn't need to be extremely costly. I think it's something everybody, whoever wants a labyrinth can have a labyrinth. Can figure out some and, way to do it. And yeah. what we'll be doing is we'll be posting the project that Lisa and I are working on together on our website so great. that you'll get to see oh, that's great. how that has evolved. And it's very exciting to see. Mm -hmm. So pathsofpeace.com mm -hmm. and needlevicedesign.com. Yes. We'll and see we'll, it in both locations. You, yep, yeah. and you can, we'll both work together for you. Oh, that sounds fantastic. What a pleasure. Thanks for the stories today, too. I mean, that whole adventure with the ladies in Chart, France, mm -hmm. from Paris to Chart and the pilgrimage. And uh, and then of course, uh, what a great contribution that you made to the folks there. That I, I don't think they're they're even realizing the impact of it right now. I'm I'm really anxious to hear, you know, stories of its use. That that portable labyrinth that you made and brought over there. I'm just intrigued by that. I can see it already in my yes. mind's eye. Yeah, probably be moving all over right. Europe. I, I would guess. think. Well, it's going to move a little bit. We already <laughs> yep. heard that. So yeah, I think that's, that's right. just wonderful. It's another edition of the Landscape and Garden Show with yours truly, BT Bob Harvey. Thanks for joining in here on the Alive and Social Network. We will see you next week.